Hi, so um, my background, so my name is Leander Grech. Um, my background is not on uh, quantum optical control or quantum mechanics whatsoever, and my background is in uh, computer engineering. So mostly I deal with um, uh, applying machine learning techniques to existing problems. And my current project now is uh, with a PhD student, Mirko Concilio, who is also showing a poster here later today. Um, and we are trying to use uh, the latest advancements in reinforcement learning to try to optimize um, quantum gate fidelity. So just a brief introduction, since most of you are here, you know about quantum optimal control. Um, it deals with designing pulses for precise qubit evolution. So, and there exists um, many algorithmic approaches, numer numerical optimizers to obtain gates to achieve these, uh, these, uh, these operations that we want, that, that are the gates that we want to optimize. And then there exists a new field, uh, a new field, well, more than 20 years old, um, that, that there's been serious research on it, which is reinforcement learning, um, which is the idea that you learn how to control a system by collecting your own experience. And just a basic overview of how uh, we will be dealing with RL in this, in this pr presentation. It's that the qubit evolution now is it will be re rewarded based on the fidelity or penalized based on the, on the leakage. Um, some of the benefits of potential benefits of using reinforcement learning is that it can be trained to be hardware agnostic, meaning that we can have a different operation be it on different um, operational parameters, such as um, varying values of the anharmonicity or the, um, the phasing noise, whatever it, it, it is. Um, so that's one nice potential of using RL. And the other one is called meta-RL. Now this is, um, meta-RL is very new, but it basically works on the principle of training something which is generalized on many tasks, but fine-tuning it to be good on one task. So for what can look like for quantum, opti or quantum optimal control would be to train over a distribution of gates, for example, the, uh, the, the basis, the, the, the gate set, for example, and then fine-tuning only for one of them. And the, the advantage is that you can do this much, much quicker than optimizing numerically. So um, a bit about the models I was using, considering that I'm a non-physicist. Um, the, the, the first one that I had, um, that I got a grip of was the SC qubits modeling quantum qubit kit, the quantum information processor. It implements a multi duffing model. Um, its computational computation subspace are the first and uh, ground state. Um, and its um, advantage is that it's very easy to use. There are the Hamiltonians predefined in there, so I don't have to worry about uh, implementing something incorrectly. And it provides a flexibility on how we can use uh, these models. But some disadvantages remain that um, we found out that it uses density matrices only for state evolution. So you cannot use state vectors to, to evolve, which makes it a bit slow. Um, there's a lot of simulation overhead, and given that we are trying to um, work with reinforcement learning, we need to be very cheap in doing these simulations. So again, this is something that we start with. Uh, this is a work in progress, and I just mentioned it for the sake of mention. But with the um, in the Department of Physics here, we'll be working um, uh, what this is the Hamiltonian of the Q tip kit. Um, but in the department here of um, of physics under Christiana Koch and some of her students, um, we will be using this uh, the model Hamiltonian of a coupler transform subject to Z control. So this will be a problem we'll be trying to make work with reinforcement learning. Um, but now um, let's get to the interesting stuff of why you'd be watching this presentation, um, which is to a bit explain a bit what is reinforcement learning. So first of all, it is not supervised. It is not unsupervised, which means that um, it doesn't need um, to have access to label data a priori. And its job is not to find hidden patterns per se, but to, to, um, to bootstrap on top of these hidden patterns. But what is exactly, what does exactly make it, what does is the key that makes reinforcement learning different from all other types of machine learning is that it can learn by interacting on its own with some environment. And its goal is to train an agent. We call it an agent, the thing which is doing your, your actions in the environment. Um, we train it to maximize the expected future reward. 
So um, we will go a bit more detail later. So the um, so this essentially would be the the function that makes reinforcement learning work. We create um, a function called v, which is trying to estimate the expected future return, and we bootstrap our value of v in the current state by the value of v in the previous state, given by a dash here, yeah? and we update our current estimate by the value of the reward return. The current plan state. Now this is all um, uh, very uh, detailed, and you have to go down the path of reinforcement learning to really understand what this is doing, but it can create um, programs which can, for example, solve which have lambda, lunar lambda, for example, GPT, for example, or does something which is a bit more uh, strange on how you'd wrap around your head exactly into how, how you program a robot arm to solve a cube without having um, information about the faces and in lists, but just by looking at the video. So this is something that these algorithms can do. For example, granted, it would take supercomputer weeks to train how to do that, but the point is the algorithms themselves. They are pretty. So a bit more about reinforcement learning, a bit more on the uh, terminology that is used. So as I mentioned before, we have an agent, which is basically a function that accepts the state at the current time, and it provides an action for that time that must be performed in the environment. Obviously, all with the goal of maximizing the, the reward in the future. A reward which is given by the environment, which is input takes an action, it transitions us to the next state of whatever system we are we care to be transitioning to, and it returns a scalar signal for the reward, which should be proportional to the performance, which means that if the performance, uh, for example, la landing the lunar lander between the, the flags, we give it a high reward, and just to do that with a, with a zero velocity. So that's uh, the reward signal, and it forms the, the basis of reinforcement learning. And with it, we can do some training. And we do training by collecting transitions of the current state, action, reward, and next state. Everything is done with this tuple. A, a, collection, a collection of these tuples makes your experience set that you'd be training your, your, own, your agent on. And as I mentioned before, the policy network, uh, which is inside the agent, it's a function that is input the state, output the action, is trained to maximize the future reward. So anything that we can formulate into this framework, we can apply a reinforcement learning algorithm on top of it to, to see what happens. So a bit of a conceptual overlook of um, how we can use reinforcement learning and how we can make an environment to uh, solve optimal control problems. Take a bit of a deeper dive into the environment itself. You can see that there is the policy now, which is which looks to be inside the agent. We can abstract that into thinking. It's a neural network, the function approximator, which takes into an state and output of the connection. So, and what's uh, good, uh, what we can just forget about is that we don't need to, to program these algorithms ourselves. There are well-tested libraries to implement state-of-the-art reinforcement learning libraries. Uh, but the real job then remains, you have to write the environment. So in the environment, you have to put your simulator, you have to put how the agent interacts with the simulator. If you, if you need memory, that is where you should you should um, put it inside inside the environment. So all the control you have on the problem is through the, the through the environment. The agent is usually not touched. You can, but it's not um, standard practice. So um, we have to touch the step method, which is boilerplate code. Step is just a standard name which tells us move one step one time step in the future. Move one time step while applying some specific action. And this will return us, um, in this case, a four tuple, for example, which represents the next state, the distance, the reward for the current time step, um, another Boolean signal called done, which gives us information whether or not we finished an episode or not. You can think of an episode, for example, uh, from the start to a finish of a game. That's one episode, or from the first position of the lunar lander to when it touches the ground. That would be another episode. And this one just gives us true or false, whether we've reached that step, and then pose just information about the environment, such as the episode length, for example. Um, but, uh, yeah, sorry for 
bad math there, but um, we have to decide on a state or whatever will be what will be evolving in our to to control a quantum system. And basically, if, um, if we want to, for example, calculate fidelity, we'll be starting by um, running, for example, four episodes starting with the basis state, running them for some p step using this this paradigm here, and then we obtain a new state from the simulator. Obviously, these states can be in the form of density matrices. They can be state vectors. In this case, they are density matrices. I made a mistake with the notation there. Uh, please bear with me. I'm not into this field, so I'm still learning. Um, but what we do is basically uh, create some observable, which hopefully contains enough information in it for the agents to be able to um, suggest us actions in the future to give us higher reward. So this is a chain reaction. And the observable state, um, at first, we uh, we took it, we took this from the previous work, which is cited here. Uh, they took the diagonal of these um, four density matrices, concatenated them all together, and they created an observable state. And um, yes, if anyone wants to discuss this, we can take this off the, this presentation. Um, moving on with uh, implementing uh, this environment, um, how can we describe, how can we build, um, uh, so uh, the, the idea is that the action now is supposed to be increasing our, um, it's supposed to bring us to a state which brings us to a high fidelity. So for example, we have a target state, the C0 for example, we start from the basis vectors, we know what the target states are, and uh, we have to choose actions, we have to choose uh, policies which um, bring us to state with, uh, to bring us to the target states. So first, at every step, we start reconstructing these policies. Uh, we go from a uh, delta um, action to, to, to so an action is a, um, is a delta, an amplitude that we apply to the to the pulses themselves. Uh, these pulses are existing in different channels that we can send to the, to the model. And building these pulses step by step, time step by time step, using these deltas, we can obtain the absolute valued amplitudes, which we then feed to our simulator. We get the evolved um, uh, the evolved states, we calculate the fidelity, and now we can talk about what the reward signal is in this case. In this case. Uh, the reward, um, sorry. So the reward uh, here, we take it as the negative log of the infidelity. Now, why the log? Because if we want fidelity to be very close to one, and obviously if we, if we keep it linear, the signal trickling back to the agent will be very small. So this is just one trick that we found in the in previous literature, how they apply the reward. Um, now, uh, I'll talk a bit about how we, have, how we um, test the environment that we made, because it's not enough that you, you build everything. You have to make sure that it actually works. So do we actually get a high fidelity for a pulse that we know um, achieves a, a high fidelity? Uh, we can test this with these, uh, with the, with these ideal pulses, which are made of uh, Gaussian drag pulses. And we feed it to the environment, um, and we just um, we just check whether or not it's doing the right job. And uh, yes, well, to show a video, I have to go out of the presentation. So this is supposed to be an animation here, but it's not working, and I lost where I was. So, anyways, in the PowerPoint. But anyways, um, we could see the state evolving on the top. Uh, the second plot shows us the uh, the pulses that are applied to the channels. So you can see in the labels, we have seven channels that we have access to. Being, for example, the ZX, the patient of set, um, XZ, all the other nice things. The third plot could show us the deltas. So that's what the agent suggests. And these deltas are used to build a, um, the pulses. And on the bottom, you'd have seen the fidelity rising up to 98.3% or something. And those would have been the ideal pulses uh, applied. But unfortunately, uh, the, the slides I have in the future are um, they're also videos. So I cannot show them. Uh, this is just a snippet of the training um, where each of those lines on top can take up to 10 hours each to train. So if you make a mistake uh, three hours down the line, you need to wait another three hours until you get 
some results, so that makes it a bit tedious. Uh, training, all in all, it uh, looks like this. These are all different metrics inside the, the agents themselves. Uh, it's actually the bug why it's not working. That's the current state of the work right now. Nothing's working. Um, but yes, another video that I cannot show. It's uh, an agent which found some, some sort of a solution where you could see the fidelity, which is bouncing. So it's, it's, it, it is choosing actions which uh, keep us in the computational subspace, um, but it's not converging to the right fidelity. Yes, and the other one, an example where it shows somewhat more stable behavior. Um, but sorry for this, I cannot show the, the video. Um, what we were thinking next is uh, on a more expressive observable, because just including the diagonals of, of density matrices is not enough. This is not enough, not nearly enough information to describe the, the system of the simulation. So uh, one thing that we're working on now is to include also, for example, the real and imaginary components of the lower triangular matrices of these of these um, density matrices. Um, and also working directly with state vectors. But for this, we need to update, update the um, Yeah, this would have been another uh, animation. Sorry for that. Um, yes, this is a work in progress, mainly inspired by, by uh, the work cited there. Um, and basically what we did, we set up an environment to, um, to simulate and Op hopefully try to optimize uh, the creation of pulses to implement these gates. And uh, yes, we want to test with other models, uh, with new algorithms, and uh, of takes this environment to a place where we can actually do useful things with it. So thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. So in spite of uh, so technical problems, so yes. Yeah. Uh, so we have time, yes. You seem to say that um, standard optimal control like GRAPE has some kind of scalability issue that the reinforcement learning would solve. And I kind of find that hard to believe. So I, I'm wondering what is that statement sort of based on? Yeah, so for um, those algorithms, you'd have to run an optimization every time you want to pass. For example, if you change the simple parameters, for example, you'd need to run the optimization. So RL, at least, it has the potential to give you the option that if you want, instead of finding the right pulse, you train a generator to give you the pulses. You can think about it that way. And then you can still change things like the gate that you want to optimize? Okay. So at least it's worth investigating now to, to win some time in the future and other things. Okay, so yes. Uh, so. Okay, okay, sure, sure, try it. <laughs> For the Zoom and for the recording, so I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right. Okay, I'll I'll start again. So uh, I had a general question. A lot of the reinforcement learning to me, it sounds an awful lot like a reinvention of adaptive control. You know, it's because you know you just change the terminology and it's a more fashionable version of adaptive control. And often, what I'm thinking when I read the papers is people don't compare with maybe older techniques in adaptive control. And I was just wondering if you could comment on this, if you have done any comparison, or you know, like maybe point out exactly to someone like me where the difference is between conventional adaptive control and maybe the kind of sexy reinforcement learning framework. Sorry for the long question. And sorry for the you all the way up. So I guess by, by adaptive control, you mean having knowledge of the model beforehand? For example, like um, model prediction. I mean, control. so it's a genetic algorithm. So, so that so. so. <laughs> I like my VIP seat here. <laughs> what I, what I meant basically, adaptive control. I mean, you know, there's uh, open loop control and feedback control. And adaptive control, the idea is you would 
get some information about the system, you make some measurement, and then you adapt your control, basically. It seems like a very similar framework. It could be genetic algorithms, but there are many other classical techniques that have been developed in engineering, and it seems they have fallen sort of a bit out of fashion, maybe. Uh, and often I'm thinking, this is, is very similar to you know what people did maybe 20 years ago, just under different name. And I'm just wondering, sometimes I'm wondering, are we reinventing the wheel, basically, just um, with different terminology? I don't know if you can comment on that. Yeah. So the main difference between the adaptive control and reinforcement learning, um, first of all, they're very similar in terminology because they achieve, they try to solve the same problem. But the main ingredient in reinforcement learning is function approximators. So the fact that you can at least estimate a function by using a neural network brings into a, a whole new mess in trying to give guarantees to these algorithms. Uh, for example, will it converge in, uh, I don't know, uh, in square time, for example, it converge in exponential amount of time. These are kinds of guarantees that have to be given uh, from theory. And uh, once you put neural network in there, um, you lose all the guarantees that you have achieved in adaptive control. You'd need a new um, loss functions which deal with this, for example, to, to deal with uh, the fact that most models overestimate how good you think your, your state is, for example. Adaptive control usually works when your med model is cheap and your model is small, and it's invertible. So in, in cases where the, the model, at least there are discontinuities, or if it's, not, uh, if it's really large or it's a bit uh, difficult to work with, you'd still have some problems in adaptive control. Um, and uh, in fact, if they did work, they, they wouldn't be using RL today, I guess. Um, there are some problems which RL is, is perfect for, others which it's not. Um, but still, this is an exploratory, exploratory research. We found uh, research which said, listen, we tried RL on the systems and they worked. Problem is they never gave any code, so we can never test it ourselves. So. Um, Part of why the reason we started directly with reinforcement learning is because it's my background, and we wanted to see if we could take it a bit further. Um, granted that these algorithms are always updating, and there's uh, this, this is a, a new frontier, and it's new algorithms could solve problems that before were not possible to solve. 